19. In Madras and Hyderabad. It was in the last days of the year 1892, when the Swami arose from his meditation at Kanyakumari and wended his way to Madras, a centre of orthodox learning and culture. From the shrine of the mother he went afoot, journeying through Ramnad and onwards, until he reached Pondicherry, south of Madras. Weary from long marches he rested there for some days, and met several young men who became his admirers and invited him to their homes. It was at Pondicherry that the Swami had a lengthy and bitter discussion with an exceedingly bigoted orthodox pandit upon many important topics relating to Hinduism and its reform. The pandit, being of the old school, antagonized the Swami at every turn. He was not so much learned as he was violent, and he became brutal in his denunciation of the Swami's progressive ideas. The conversation turned on the question of sea voyage. When the Pandit could not hold his ground against the Swami, he would often interrupt him blurting out in Sanskrit with wild gestures, Katpina, Katpina, never, never. My friend, the Swami cried out at last, what do you mean? Upon every educated Indian devolves the responsibility of submitting the contents of the dharma to the test asterisk, for this reason we must come out of the limited grooves of the past and take a look at the world as it moves onwards to progress at the present day. And if we find that there are hidebound customs which are impeding the growth of our social life or disturbing our philosophical outlook, it is time for us to take an advance step by eschewing them. The Swami spoke also concerning the uplift of the masses and said that the time was at hand when the Shudras would arise and demand their rights and privileges. He insisted that it was the duty of the educated Indians to help the downtrodden masses by giving them education to spread the ideal of social equality and to root out the tyranny of priestcraft and the evils of national disorganization, which the perversion of the caste system and of the higher principles of religion had brought on. Destiny works in strange ways. It so happened that Mr. Manrathanath Bhattacharya chanced to meet the Swami plodding up from Rameswaram with staff and Kamandalu in hand. Learning that the Swami was on his way to Madras, Mr. Bhattacharya insisted that he should travel with him and be his guest. The Swami consented and they started for Madras. There the Swami found awaiting him a dozen or more of the finest young men of the city who in time became his disciples. From the day of his arrival he was besieged by numerous visitors. From this time on the Swami seemed to be on the high road to public recognition. It was in Madras that many young men became his devoted adherents. It was here that he secured the funds wherewith he was enabled to go to America. It was in Madras that the message of his master gained a ready acceptance. It was here, also, that his first work in India in the way of organization and publication was commenced, and it was his Madrasi disciples who widely circulated his message even before his return from the West. With the many eager inquirers who sought interviews with him, the Swami would discuss religion, psychology, science, literature or history. One day, when the Swami was in an exalted mood in which all thought was sublimated, Someone asked him, Swamiji, why is it that in spite of their Vedantic thought the Hindus are idolaters? The Swami with flashing eyes turned on the questioner and answered, because we have the Himalayas. He meant thereby that, surrounded by nature so sublime and soul-string, man cannot but fall down and adore. The Swami's personality towered over everything. His thrilling musical voice, his songs, his strength of soul, his powerful intellect, his luminous and ready replies, his scintillating wit, his epigrams and eloquence held his hearers spellbound. And day after day the number of those who came to the house of Mr. Bhattacharya increased. 
He combined a spirit of humility with what would seem to be at times an aggressive self-consciousness. For sometimes, he would beg pardon of a pundit who had insulted him, calling himself an ignorant fellow. At other times, he would burst like a hurricane upon his audience, giving them no opportunity to escape from the currents of his thought. But all this was unostentatious and informal. He spoke no harsh words against anyone, but he did not refrain from criticism when necessary. For example, there was the case of the Pandit who asked him if there was any harm in giving up Sandhya Vandana or prayers performed in the morning, noon and evening because of lack of time. What cried the Swami almost ferociously, those giants of old, the ancient rishis who never walked but strode, of whom if you were but to think for a moment you would be shriveled into a moth, they, sir, had time, and you have no time. In that same meeting, when a westernized Hindu spoke in a belittling manner of the meaningless teachings of the Vedic seers, the Swami fell upon him with a thunderbolt vehemence, crying out, How dare you criticize your venerable forefathers in such a fashion? A little learning has muddled your brain. Have you tested the science of the Rishis? Have you even as much as read the Vedas? There is the challenge thrown by the Rishis. Vertical bar if you dare oppose them, take it up. To relieve the undue strain put upon himself by the constant influx of people, the Swami used to walk in the evening on the seashore. One day, when he saw the wretched and half-starved children of the fishermen working with their mothers, waist deep in the water, tears filled his eyes, and he cried out, O Lord, why dost thou create these miserable creatures? I can asterisk not bear the sight of them. How long, O Lord, how long will those who were in his company were overcome and burst into tears? A party was arranged in his honour one evening. All the intellectual luminaries of Madras were present. The Swami declared himself to be an Advaitin, boldly, almost challengingly. A clique of intellectuals asked him, You say you are one with God. Then all your responsibility is gone. What is there to kick you when you do wrong and when you stray from the right path? The Swami replied crushingly, if I honestly believe that I am one with God, I shall abominate wise and no check is needed. In the course of a similar conversation in the palace of the Raja of Ramnad, someone had jeered at him for his assertion that it was possible for a human being to see Brahman, the unknown. Aroused at once, he exclaimed, I have seen the unknown. The Swami held several conversations at the Literary Society of Triplicane, which had given him his first introduction to the public. Many of its young members belonged to the social reform movement in Madras. But he saw that they were working from the wrong point of view, that of sweeping condemnation. In his repeated talks, the Swami emphatically urged upon them the necessity of critically analyzing foreign ideals and of avoiding the assimilation of irreligious foreign culture. He said that they should invoke the aid of all that was great and glorious in the past, otherwise the very foundations of the national structure would be undermined. He told them that he was not an enemy of social reform, on the contrary, he yearned for reforms, but they must come from within and not from without and must be constructive and not destructive. There came to him an atheist, the assistant professor of science in the Christian college, Singadrivelu Mudiliar. He saw the pragmatic values of Christianity and criticized Hinduism. He came to argue, but at the end of the conversation, he was converted to the Swaraj's way of thinking and became his ardent disciple. The Swami loved him very much and called him Kidi. He said of him afterwards jocularly, Caesar said, I came, I saw, I conquered but Kidi came, he saw, and was conquered. After a time Kidi devoted his life to the Swami's cause, and when at his suggestion the Prabuddha Bharatha was started in Madras, 
Kidi became its honorary manager. He later renounced the world to lead the life of a recluse and died a saintly death. Mr. V. Subramanya Ayer says that he went with some of his class fellows to the house of Mr. Bhattacharya, intending to have some fun. THFTY found the Swami smoking his hookah in a sort of half-awake, half-dreamy state, seemingly in deep contemplation. One bolder than the others advanced and asked, Sir, what is God? The Swami smoked on as if entirely oblivious of the question. Then he raised his eyes and said as if by way of reply, Well, my fellow, what is energy? When the boy and his companions were unable to give any real definition, the Swami roused himself and said, What is this? You cannot define a simple word like energy, which you use every day of your life, and yet you want me to define God. They asked other questions, but the Swami's replies crushed them. After a time the boys left, but Mr. Ayer, who was greatly impressed, remained and accompanied the Swami and his disciples on his daily walk to the seashore. Casually the Swami asked Mr. Ayer, Well, my boy, can you wrestle? Receiving an answer in the affirmative, the Swami said in fun, Come, let us have a tussle. Surprised at the Swami's athletic skill and strength of muscle, Mr. Ayer called him Taiwan Swami or the Athlete Swami. It so happened that one day the Swami found the cook of Mr. Bliyattacharya looking longingly at the hookah which the Maharaja of Mysore had given him, and so he asked him, Would you like to have this? The Swami repeated his question, and seeing the man puzzled and afraid to say yes, he then and there handed it to him. The man could not believe that he meant it. But when he actually had it in his hands, he was grateful beyond words, and those who heard of the incident saw what renunciation the Swami had, for he loved that hookah, his only comfort. It was customary with him throughout his life to give away whatever anyone admired in his possession. On one occasion in America a young man, Mr. Prince Woods, one coveted the staff which he had used whilst journeying to many pilgrimages during his wandering days. He had brought it all the way from India and prized it for its sacred associations. But he gave it away instantly, saying, What you admire is already yours. One Swamiji gave his trunk and blanket to Prince's mother, Mrs. Kate Tennant Woods of Salem, at whose home he stayed for a few days in September, 1893. The Swami had a strange experience about this time. For some days, he was bothered by waves of psychic disturbance sent by some spirits. The spirits reported all sorts of false things to make his mind uneasy, which statements he learned later to be untrue. When they had thus annoyed him for some days, he remonstrated, whereupon they told him of their miserable condition. The Swami thought over the matter, and one day repairing to the seashore, he took a handful of sand as a substitute for rice and grain and offered it praying with his whole heart that these spirits might find rest. Thereafter they ceased to bother him, having attained peace. In Madras the Swami gained numerous followers. The experience he had in Alvar was here intensified many times, for people flocked from all parts to hear him. More and more he revealed the strength, the purity and the effulgence of his soul, and his sweet personality captivated their hearts even as his ideas captivated their intellects. Mr. K. Vyasarao, B.A., speaks as follows, in a reminiscent mood of the Swami of these days and the impression he created. A graduate of the Calcutta University, with a shaven head, a prepossessing appearance, wearing the garb of renunciation, fluent in English and Sanskrit, with uncommon powers of repartee, who sang with full-throated ease asterisk as though he was attuning himself to the spirit of the universe and with all a wanderer on the face of the earth. The man was sound and stalwart, full of sparkling wit, 
with nothing but a scathing contempt for miracle working agencies, one who enjoyed good dishes, knew how to appreciate the hookah and the pipe, yet harped on renunciation with an ability that called forth admiration and a sincerity that commanded respect. The young bachelors and masters of arts were at their wits and at the sight of such a phenomenon. There, they saw the man and saw how well he could stand his ground in wrestling and fencing in the arena of the universal soul. And when the hour of discussion gave way to lighter moods, they found that he could indulge in fun and frolic, in uncompromising denunciation and in startling Don's moths. But everything else apart, what endeared him to all was the unalloyed fervour of his patriotism. The young man who had renounced all worldly ties and freed himself from bondage had but one love, his country, and one grief, its downfall. These sent him into reveries which held his hearers spellbound. Such was thy man who travelled from Hooghly to Tamarpari, who bewailed and denounced in unmeasured terms the imbecility of our young men, whose words flashed as lightning and cut as steel, who impressed all, communicated his enthusiasm to some, and lighted the spark of undying faith in a chosen few. To many the Swami seemed the very embodiment of the culture of the Darshanas, the Agamas and the Yogas. He was saturated with the living consciousness not only of the Hindu spiritual experience, but also of the philosophical and scientific achievements of the West. One who was highly cultured, and became his disciple in these days, spoke of him thus. The vast range of his mental horizon perplexed and enraptured me. From the Rigveda to Raghuvamsha, from the metaphysical flights of the Vedanta philosophy to modern Kant and Hegel, the whole range of ancient and modern literature and art and music and morals, from the sublimities of ancient yoga to the intricacies of a modern laboratory, everything seemed clear to his field of vision. It was this which confounded me, made me his slave. Another disciple writes, He frequently had to descend to the level of his questioners and to translate his soaring thoughts into their language. He would often anticipate several questions ahead and give answers that would satisfy the questioners at once. When asked how he so understood them, he would say with a smile that sannyasins were doctors of men and that they were able to diagnose their cases before they administered remedies to them. At times many men's thoughts were his. He would answer scores of questioners at one time and silence them all. Soft and forgiving as he was to those on whom his grace rested, one had to live in his presence as in the vicinity of a dangerous explosive. The moment a bad thought entered one's mind, it would flash across him also. One could know it from a peculiar smile that lit his lips and from the words that would casually escape from his mouth in the course of conversation. Already he had announced his intention of going to the West. He said about it to all those who knew him in Madras. And those who listened saw with him the imperative need of preaching the Dharma. And they understood the intention of the Swami to sail for the distant shores of the West. Not only did they understand his intention, they themselves intensified it. They went forth eager to raise subscriptions for the cause. He himself had had it long in mind to attend the Parliament of Religions, but he took no definite step in this matter, preferring to abide by the will of the Mother. And those who went forth to raise funds soon collected some five hundred rupees. But the Swami, when he saw the money, grew nervous. He said to himself, Am I following my own will? Am I being carried away by enthusiasm? Or is there a deep meaning in all that I have thought and planned? He prayed, O Mother, show me thy will, it is thou who art the doer. Let me be only thy instrument. He, a sannyasin, inexperienced in the ways of the world, was about to sail for far distant lands, alone, 
unknown, to meet strange peoples and deliver to them a strange message. And so he said to the astonished disciples, My boys, I am determined to force the mother's will. She must prove that it is her intention that I should go, for it is a step in the dark. If it be her will, then money will come again of itself. Therefore, take this money and distribute it amongst the poor. His disciples obeyed him without a word, and the Swami felt as though a great burden had been taken off his shoulders. He again settled down to the life of the teacher and prayed to the mother and the master in the solitude of his soul for guidance and direction. And in these days he meditated intensely. The monk with the prodigious intellect and the fire of patriotism became transformed into a simple child waiting for the mother's call, knowing that it would come. His soul grew tense with determination to make the mother speak her will. But while he was in this devotional state, many of those in Hyderabad who had heard of the Swami from their Madras friends begged him to come on a brief visit. He readily consented, thinking that there must be a hidden purpose in this unexpected call. His host at Madras telegraphed to a friend, Babu Madhusudan Chatterjee, the superintending engineer of His Highness the Nizam, that the Swami was to arrive at Hyderabad on the 10th of February and be his guest. On the clay previous, the Hindus of Hyderabad and Sikandarabad had called a public meeting to arrange a fitting reception for the Swami. So when he arrived at Hyderabad, he was surprised to find on the station platform 500 people assembled to receive him, including the most distinguished members of the court of Hyderabad, several of the nobility and many rich merchants, pleaders and pandits, notable amongst whom were Raja Srinivas Rao Bahadur, Maharaja Rambha Rao Bahadur, Pandit Ratan Le, Captain Raghunath, Shamsululima Sayyid Ali Bilgrami, Nawab Imad Jang Bahadur, Nawab Dula Khan Bahadur, Nawab Imad Nawaz Jang Bahadur, Nawab Sikandar Nawaz Jang Bahadur, Mr. H. Dorabji, Mr. F. S. Mandan, Rai Hukum Chand, M. A., L. L. D. Sets Chaturbhuj and Motilal, bankers, and the host and his son, Babu Kali Charan Chatterjee. Babu Kali Charan, who was known to the Swami in Calcutta, introduced everyone to him. Flowers and garlands were heaped upon the monk, writes an eyewitness as follows, We have never seen such crowds gathered before to receive a Swami. It was a magnificent reception. On the morning of 11th February, a committee of 100 Hindu residents of Sikandarabad approached him with offerings of sweets, milk and fruits and asked him to deliver a lecture at the Mahbub College in their city. The Swami consented, fixing the 13th as the date. Then he drove with Babu Kali Charan to the fort at Golconda of historic note and famous for its diamonds. On returning, the Swami found awaiting him a bearer from the private secretary to Nawab Bahadur Sir Khurshid Jah, Amiri I Kabir, KCSI, the foremost nobleman of Hyderabad and the brother-in-law of His Highness the Nizam, requesting him to come to the palace for an interview on the following morning. At the appointed hour the Swami, accompanied by Babu Kali Charan, went to the palace where he was received by an aide-de-camp of the Nawab. Sir Khurshid Jah was noted for religious tolerance and was the first Mohammedan to visit all the Hindu places of pilgrimage from the Himalayas to Cape Kamarin. He received the Swami warmly. For more than two hours the interview lasted, the Swami discussing the contents of Hinduism, Christianity and Islam. The Nawab took exception to the idea of the personal God as represented in Hinduism, himself believing in the impersonal ideal. Then the Swami spoke to him of the evolution of the idea of God and proved the necessity of the conception of Him as a person, a pragmatic factor in human experience, the highest conception of human nature. He pointed out that every other religion but Hinduism depended on the life of some person who was its founder, while Vedantism was based upon eternal principles and not upon persons, 
and that it was on this that it based its claim of being the universal religion. Rising higher and higher in his intellectual flights, the Swami introduced to the mind of the Nawab the whole background of religious ideas as having arisen from the inmost depths of the human nature and out of the perception of the truth. He said that all ideals were true and that the different religious systems were but special paths for the attainment of these various ideals, which, when intensified, were certain to draw out the divinity within man. Then, bringing the ideas of the Absolute and Vedanta into the discussion, he stated that man was the greatest of all beings, for it was out of the human spiritualized intelligence that all the truths of the universe had been discovered, and that he transcended all limitations and was divine. He then gave out his intention of going to the West to preach the gospel of the universal, eternal religion. His eloquence deeply impressed the Nawab, who said, Swamiji, I am ready to help you in your undertaking with 1000 rupees. But the Swami declined to accept the money at that time, saying that he would ask for it when he actually embarked on his mission. On the morning of the 13th he met by appointment Sir Ashman Ja, KCSI, the Prime Minister of Hyderabad, the Maharaja Norendra Krishna Bahadur, Peshkar of the state, and the Maharaja Shuraj Bahadur, and all these noblemen promised their support for his proposed propaganda in America. In the afternoon he delivered a lecture at the Mahbub College on my mission to the West. The chair was occupied by Pandit Ratan Leh. Many Europeans attended this lecture, and more than 1,000 persons were present. The Swami's command over the English language, his learning, his power of expression and his eloquence were a revelation to all. On the next day the well-known bankers of the Bigam Bazaar, headed by Set Motilal, interviewed him, and they all promised to help him with his passage money. Some of the members of the Theosophical Society and of the Sanskrit Dharma Mandal Sabem also came. On 15th February, the Swami received a telegram from Pune, signed by the leading citizens in the name of the Hindu societies of the city, urging him to come on a visit there. But the Swami replied that he could not come then, but that he would be very happy to go when he could. The next day he went to see the ruins of the Hindu temples, the famous tomb of Baba Sarafurdin and also the palace of Sir Salarjan. It was in Hyderabad that he met a famous yogi, gifted with psychic powers. He was a Brahman of learning and culture who had given himself up to the training of the faculties of the mind and had developed many subtle powers. When the Swami arrived, he found the man sick of a high fever. The yogi seeing a sannyasin before him asked him to sit near him, and regarding him by his signs to be a highly developed spiritual soul, begged him to put his hand on his head. On the Swami's doing so the fever left, and he sat up. When the Swami told him of the object of his visit, he demonstrated some of his wonderful powers. The Swami pondered long over the phenomena he had witnessed and finally came to the conclusion that they weet of a subjective character and that by the development of the faculties of the mind the greatest and most surprising phenomena could occur. Some of his reflections on this incident and allied subjects were embodied in a lecture he gave in California called The Powers of the Mind. On 17th February, the Swami left Hyderabad. More than 1,000 persons came to the railway station to bid him farewell. His pious simplicity, unfailing self-control and profound meditation, writes Babu Kali Charan, made an indelible impression on the citizens of Hyderabad. When the Swami returned from Hyderabad to Madras, he was accorded an ovation at the station by his numerous disciples.